Atheist Nomads, episode 115. Interview with Chris Matheson. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, man. How's it going? And joining us today is Chris Matheson. Uh, also known as the ugly waiter and the ugly seance member from Bill and Ted's. <laughs> Yeah. And he that's was right. also the writer, or one of the writers of, of Bill and Ted's uh, Excellent yeah, Adventure and Bogus Journey. Yeah, that that's so sidebar, though, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, it's the, it's the ugly waiter part that I think really counts. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a book out now, too. I do. The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Yeah. As told from the atheist perspective. Yeah, very much so. Um, it's... Uh, kind of going through the whole Bible from beginning to end and honestly just looking for the most ridiculous things. And there's a lot of them and stacking mm-hmm. them up. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, from beginning to end, there's just a lot of craziness. And, and then just telling the story from this God guy's point of view, pretty much like, what does he think he's doing? This plan doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. What does he think he's doing here? <laughs> well, and I, I've, to be honest, I haven't read the entire thing, but at least got through the first mm-hmm. third or so of it and skimmed through uh, a lot of the rest. Uh, the the stuff that you were you were having a lot of fun with. Uh, I was a, a theology major in college and yeah. uh, did a year of of master of divinity studies in the seminary, and that's all stuff that theologians have been wrestling with for millennia. You can see why. Uh huh. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> They're not going to win that wrestling match. It, you know, it's taken 2,000 years, at least on the, the legitimately just Christian stuff. And yeah, they're still having a hard time with some of it. Yeah. Well, there's, it really is kind of like trying to square a circle. There, there's just, there's a lot of things like you, there, you can't, I don't think it can be done. You, you can <laughs> sort of wave your hands around and, and talk about just fall back on mystery and inscrutability and things like that. But there's a lot of it that just really doesn't make much sense. Yeah, like the uh, the whole creation aspect. Uh, you're, you're, the way you were playing around with that was absolutely awesome. Uh, there's <laughs> so much that's just mind-boggling there. It's very hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah. It just like, w- if he's eternal, and of course we have to accept that he's eternal, right? I mm-hmm. mean, that's just built in. You can't say, no, he just winked into existence at that moment because then he's not, he's not God. But then he's, well, then who made him? You know, no, he's eternal. Of course, he has to be eternal. That's the stopping point. He's, he's the first cause of everything. But the universe is not eternal. We know that. It's either, you know, 14 billion years old or much more likely 6,000 years old. But <laughs> it's, it did come into existence. And that basically leads to the question, what was he doing before? Why why was he just sitting in the darkness doing nothing? More or less eternally, what was he doing? Well, whenever I sat in the dark and my mom asked me what I was doing, you know, I I never actually told her that I was masturbating, but, you know. Maybe that's what he was doing. He was just (laughs) jerking off for a long, wanking it for eons. Yeah, and then finally he's like, "I want something to look at." Um, You know, I've used up my little inner, you know, Rolodex. I I gotta have actual physical things to check out. Ran out of toilet paper. Yeah, he's. I think this this is probably a sacrilegious idea to to suggest that, but you know, (laughs) it is 
it is plausible. Even if you go with the more liberal interpretation that, you know, God started the Big Bang and the universe is 14 point whatever billion years yeah. old, then, okay, what was he doing for the eternity prior to that? Yeah, exactly. And furthermore, I mean, in a weird way, the creationists, their, their story is so kind of stunted and intellectually retarded, you know? It's like, you've got to be kidding. I mean, really? Like, you believe that? However, it does have a certain kind of logical coherence to it because this whole thing's about us. This is this entire thing. Everything's about us. Therefore, he just bang, he just did it. And we were the center of the whole thing. And you know what? That makes, that kind of makes sense in a, in a dumb way. But if the, if the universe is in fact, whatever, 14.5 billion years old and humans, uh, you know, modern humans like like us emerged maybe in the last two hundred thousand years, maybe something like that, maybe even less than that. If you're talking about people who think like us, maybe a hundred thousand. And so, what was he doing for that fourteen? I mean, if the whole thing, if the whole point's us, as it obviously is in the Bible, well, then what was he doing for fourteen point? Why? Why was there like a billion years of slime molds? You know, what's the <laughs> point of that? Like. Why? Why? I mean, first of all, like, I mean, 10 billion years of, of nothing, no life at all, at least in earth terms. And then it was just slime. Causing supernovas. Yeah. He started supernovas. Maybe he likes fireworks. Apparently he likes, he likes fireworks. He's American, obviously. He likes to watch things blow up. Yeah. Yeah. God is American, obviously. Jesus, definitely. So yeah, of course he fucking loves guns and fireworks. Yeah, they're they are they are clearly uh, American men. Yes, mm-hmm. and you know the the first ten trillion years of or ten billion years of the the universe was mostly supernovas. I so, guess that's the answer. Yeah, he was just checking them out, and he's like, "Cool, cool, ah, cool." Yeah, <laughs> I guess that explains it. Oh wait, what's this carbon stuff, and what can I do with it? Yeah, now <laughs> now God I'll is such a bro. Just, he, <laughs> God is a bro. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then probably more masturbating when he was bored. Yeah. Jeez. Like you do. Why would you stop? I mean, <laughs> it's not like he ever had sex with anybody. Well, you know, unless he it, did. I mean, unless he actually came down and physically had sex with, with Mary, which is a, you know, we're not told that, but maybe he well, did. If, if so, I'm sure it went very badly. I mean, she was a virgin, so I'm, I'm guessing it was just the tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if he'd watched humans doing it for 4,000 years, maybe he wanted to give it a try. It could be. It could yeah, be. Sure. But I just, I, you know, my suspicion, given the character we meet on the page, is, yeah, I don't think he'd be too good at it. I think afterwards <laughs> she'd be talking to her friends and she'd be like, yeah, that wasn't really so good. He was, like, really fast. And, and then he got really kind of defensive and embarrassed and he hustled out of there pretty quick. <laughs> And you'd think, given that he created the whole thing, that he, you know, maybe would have given himself a better, you know, unit than he did. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) I guess you're not supposed to talk about God's penis. I guess that's really not an acceptable uh, subject to talk about, but I don't see any reason why not. Well, I mean, he's like the ultimate alpha male. I don't know why you wouldn't want to. Yeah, right. We should be fascinated by it. And throughout the Bible, he is very, very uh, obsessed with male genitalia. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, he really is. Not just with the, the circumcision, but also, yo, know, you can't go to the temple if you've got damaged testicles. He's got a big thing for perfect balls. You know, he's he's loves those perfect, perfect balls. And uh, he won't eat a goat that has damaged balls and he won't be served by a dude who has damaged balls. He's got a really clear idea of what balls should look like <laughs> and penises. I mean, if you get right down to it, it's like, damn, you know, that foreskin was a mistake. It was a mistake. You should get rid of it. It just looks so much better without it. Yeah, Which you know, you're streamlined handling. and yeah. And, and your handling of that in the book was just awesome. <laughs> cool. Right. About how he didn't like, the way his looked and figured it might be able to fix that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You know, sure. It makes it look better. It was a giant mistake. Just Shouldn't a little nip that. tuck, you know? Hey. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Quite a few years back, I, I read a book by um, 
Oh shit. Uh, Christopher Moore. Mm -hmm. Uh, lamb, the gospel according to Biff, right? uh, Christ childhood pal. Yeah. I would love to see both of you guys kind of work on a project. I'm I'm sure that would never happen, but (laughs) well, you never know. You never know. Uh, I've never met the guy. I I have zero contact with the guy. So unlikely, but nothing's impossible, I guess. Yeah. Just, just that whole irreverent, uh, look between, between the pages and, and like, you know, I don't know if you've read it, but, um, just basically that, the whole 30 ish years of between, you know, when, you know, he's born and then he comes back, you know, there's a giant gap in time and kind of fills it in for you. There is, there's like, uh, I don't think, I mean, we got all, you know, you're talking about him growing up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, we just, we don't, we don't get a lot. We get a lot of images of him as, as a baby, which are really funny. I love paintings of the baby Jesus because they just tend to be so weird and kind of, he looks like a little puppet or he looks like a little man or he looks, he looks kind of like a little mongoloid child or he's got a micro phallus or and, you know, he just never looks right. Or he's doing that little hand symbol you do to like convey like, yeah, I'm God. I know I'm God. Or, or he's got little baby John the Baptist there as his friend. They're always really, yeah. really strange, you know? Um, and, or he looks like a little doll laying on the ground and people are just sort of standing around him looking at him like not sure what to do and mary always looks weird because she always looks uncomfortable kind of like ah what do i you know she, like all those uh kind of um, medieval paintings of of mary and baby jesus are just hilarious and then he just kind of goes away like there are no there are very few images of like jesus as an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 17-year-old like i'm not aware of very many at all yeah um, i want to see the awkward like 13-year-old with acne yeah, there are some great stories. There's the Gospel of Thomas, which is sort of apocryphal, but hmm. it's super funny because he like kills his little friends and and he's like he's like the bad seed, you know. He uses his power in bad ways, and people tell him and Mary they have to leave town because they're scared of him, and you know, he like it's it's great. Yeah. Oh, when you start getting those apocryphal gospels, you eventually get to the ones with you know him and Mary Magdalene hooking up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But I'm right. But I think that one's like actually in some of the holy books. I mean, that's actually in the official Apocrypha, you know, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, I think, yeah, some some additions. It's the crazy thing when you're, you know, as to what's Apocrypha and what's not and what's canon right. and what's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, generally people think that it was completely decided by, you know, the, the fourth century. It really wasn't. There was still books coming and going from both the Old and New Testament until roughly the Latin Vulgate was finally finalized. I think that was 14th century. Wow. 14th or 15th. Wow. Oh, that's a lot later than I would have thought. Yeah. And then, yeah. well, actually the, the apocryphal Old Testament texts, those were still in it until the Protestants decided, oh, no, we don't want those. <laughs> so really the Protestant Bible, that was more... 17th century right right yeah so it took a long time to just sort of firm up what their story was i guess yeah and each book has a little bit different uh adds a little bit to the canon or yeah complicates it (laughs) yeah but boy it would be great if we had more stories of him from you know three to 30 you know it would kind of fill in the uh fill in the story a little bit one of the things that I always find really peculiar about the book, and I, and on some level, it just makes me look at it and go, doesn't this discredit the whole thing somehow? Is that like Mary doesn't seem to believe him. Mary gave birth to the son of God. I mean, if anybody knows who this guy is, it's her, right? But yeah. she doesn't seem to believe that he's who he says he is. And like that one thing, I mean, you read it and you go, how did this ever end up in the book? I mean, this is crazy. Why didn't they cut this out? This is just like so undercuts their their claim in a way. But like, yeah. wouldn't she know? Temple? What's that? When he went to the temple, like, didn't you know I have to be about my father's work? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the wedding in Cana. What are you doing? 
Don't make an ass of yourself. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Right. <laughs> yeah, and like, wouldn't she, wouldn't she just be like, I, of course I understand you're doing your, uh, you are following your, your course, your appointed task in this world. And I know it very well because the angel came and told me that's not like that at all though. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it, it's undercuts the message, but yet I've heard sermons on Mary and Jesus's brothers not being good believers. But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the brothers, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe the brothers, you could extrapolate emotionally and go, well, they're jealous, you know, they're, they're, they're not Jesus. They're, they're just humans. And he said, whatever, I don't know. But Mary, Mm -hmm. why would she not be a good believer? That doesn't make any sense. An angel comes down and tells her what's going to happen. And she has sex with God or is impregnated with God or something by God. And then she doesn't buy it. Like, okay, that's a, that's pretty fishy. If you ask me, which that fits yeah. better with the hypothesis that she was raped by a Roman soldier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. I could totally buy Joseph being pissed, but you know, he seems to be like a pretty good guy of sorts. He, he would seem to be, uh, pretty at peace with, uh, being, uh, cuckolded by God. I guess right. if you're going to be cuckolded, you know, that's like, well, it was God, you know, I mean, if some other dude's going to have my woman, I, I guess, I guess God's, I guess that's good. I guess that's flattering to you on some level. So is that why Christians now think that marriages should be a three way with God? <laughs> it's pretty literal, so weird. right? Right. Like, you know, I actually saw one of those little license plate rims just a couple days ago where it was like Adam, Jesus, and Sarah. Adam, Jesus, and... I think that was actually her husband's name was Adam. Oh, okay. Adam, Jesus, and and her name's Sarah, you think? Yeah. So she's basically proposing a kind of a three-way with her and Jesus and her husband. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Have fun. Yeah, it had on top, it was like married... uh, March something a couple of years ago, and then it was Adam, Jesus, and Sarah. So I guess, like, you know, while her husband's, you know, fucking her, she's blowing Jesus is what it amounts to. Yeah, sure. Sure. Something she could like be the, the cream in that Oreo. Yeah. 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 Hot. That's kind of gross. Hot. Hot. Well, yeah. Okay. I might pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus as a porn star. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it dark here. <laughs> well, there's worse things. I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe he'd be, he'd be very, uh, maybe he'd be very good at it and very happy with it. Hey, if he can turn water into wine, then who knows what he can do, right? When you yeah. just start extrapolating there, then get you drunk by turning your saliva into vodka. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah turns water into wine then he turns the wine into astroglide you know mm-hmm. sure yeah. thanks jesus and if he can walk on water yeah uh, imagine what he could do with you know any kind lubricants? of lubricants that are there right yeah, yeah totally he's, water-based lubricants he certainly could walk on them if that's what was required or he would just know how to use them in a very skillful way i think yeah. <laughs> yeah. nobody's ever been better with lubricants than jesus <laughs> And he can walk on them too. Okay. <laughs> Most people would fall down. Yeah. He does not. Yeah. Yeah. He walks around like he's wearing golf cleats. I mean, he's just totally solid. I want to see him like, I want to just see him like sink, just totally sink right into it. Like a non Newtonian solid. Huh. Yeah, just wow. Know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you with this? Yeah. 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 Just, you know, something that you could actually walk on if you're like good enough at it, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want to see him sink down into it. Yeah. So kind Just of, kind of the op- opposite reaction. Oh, I see. So it's yeah. like, oh, Jesus can't. It turns out that he can't walk on that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be kind of a letdown for those watching, I think. It would be, but. Yeah. Wow. I thought Jesus could walk on anything. And then the other person, I think, could logically say, well, just because he can walk on water and he can walk on lubricants doesn't mean he can walk on anything. And we, he's now met his match. He can't walk on that thing. Yeah, but I, that's, my, that's the trade-off. That's the trade-off. Or maybe he'd practice and get better, and like a week later, it'd be like, dude, he's walking on it. All right, we're gonna take a quick break now. 
We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, so Chris, um, I'm actually really curious about you as a person, though. Um, uh, I mean, you're not that old. Uh, you know. I'm pretty old. I mean, maybe I'm not that old. I, yeah, okay. I, I, won't, I won't say that you were born in 59, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so... No, don't not, say that. Jeez. Wesley, no. are you on IMDb? No. Yeah. No, maybe. Google. <laughs> yeah, all <laughs> no, right. So but, we've established I'm kind of an old man. All right. So what's the... What sure, doing? sure. But yeah. I, I was kind of curious about your up, upbringing, though. Um, yeah. Were you raised religious or have any ties to... No, no. Well, I mean... I mean like, I how did you get interested in this? Mainly no, but kind of a weird version of yes. No, in that no, no organized religion. I never went to church uh-huh. at all um, once, uh, all the whole time I grew up. I mean, not even with a friend. I mean, just nothing. I just never, never set foot inside a church. When I first set foot inside a church, like in my mid to late twenties, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. There's like a lot yeah. going on in here. Um, so none of that, but I would say a lot of, um, uh, a lot of dogma, that I grew up with. Um, I did grow up with kind of like a lot of new agey really, you know, it's Southern California in the seventies, you know, it's a lot of new agey kind of stuff, a lot of astrology and pyramids and Bigfoot Mm -hmm. and, you know, you name it, just all that, all that crap. I was sort of surrounded by, and then a, a, a kind of a, a big, I would say sort of dogmatic idea of like, you know, um, family, what a family should be, how family behaves. And so that, so that got to me, but in Mm. terms of like any like organized religion, although bizarrely, I I, I remember like when I was about 10 or 11, my parents were (laughs) talking, it seems ludicrous, but they were talking about converting to Judaism. And I don't really know why. I think the reason was they liked um, going to, um, you know, Jewish delicatessens and getting the food. <laughs> that, that seemed to be the main reason. And they knew like a Jewish couple and they thought, oh, they're very family oriented. So we'll convert to Judaism, which is so absurd. Of course, they never really pursued it, but they talked about it for a while. And I think they were proud of it um, for some dumb reason. Um, <laughs> but no, no, no organized religion at all. And then I, I just sort of, I mean, if you have any intellectual curiosity at all, um, and I have very little, but if you have any at all, <laughs> you're going to eventually look at religion, right? I mean, we're surrounded by it. It's everywhere. It's It informs our entire culture. It's It's just ubiquitous. So, I just started looking at it at a certain point and I was very fascinated by it pretty quickly because it, it, well, it was very alien and very strange. And from a comedic standpoint, I just thought it was like such a gold mine. I was like, it made me laugh. I was like, wow, I just so many times where I'd like kind of be reading the book and just look around like, this can't be for real. This is like, and this is ludicrous, you know? So that was kind of how I ended up drifting towards it. So I'm very obsessed with things that anything that claims to be absolute truth, like capital A, capital T. Oh man, I just can't stay away from those things. Cause I'm going to do everything I possibly can to prove that they are not absolute truth because there's, there's just something about that approach in life that, position. I possess absolute truth. It just, I don't know. It's like a red flag gets waved in front of me. It just makes me mad and it makes me want to do what I can to, to tip it over. And, and so therefore I make fun of it, you know, cause that's kind of what I know how to do. Okay. That's kind of fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, and okay. You compare absolute truth to say science and Science does not claim to be absolute, and everything right. that it claims can be revised. And constantly is being revised. Yeah. I mean, as we speak, the the story, our understanding of whatever, the universe and everything in it, is is evolving and is changing. And it's not what it was 200 years ago, and, and, and it's not what it will be 200 years from now. And that's built into it. It's meant to change, and, and, and science embraces that. And, 
uh, versus religion, which is just, it just like freezes it. Like, no, this is the, and beyond that, I mean, what's super, super infuriating about these people to me anyway, well, there's a lot, but, but one of them <laughs> is that like, we don't believe on our side that anything different is going to happen to them when they die as what's going to happen to us, right? We're just going to die. We're going to die just like they are. The quality of our lives will be what it is, and theirs will be what it is, and then we'll die and and disintegrate and get eaten by worms or whatever, and that's it, and, and life ends for us individually. They, on the other hand, think that they're going to be – that we're going to be tormented eternally for disagreeing with them. So, we don't think that they're going to be punished for disagreeing with us except that they're kind of squandering their lives in a way, but they think we're going to be punished eternally for disagreeing with them. And that's kind of a big difference. And when you get to that, it's like, all right, well, those, those, those are kind of fighting words now, you know, any idea of like being respectful of you guys, any idea of like sort of being, you know, uh, you know, careful about your faith and not making fun of them. Well, fuck that, you know? <laughs> Fuck that. You think we're going to be punished eternally because we don't agree with you? I would say game on, you know? That and the whole eternal reward thing that they think they're going to get. And they're going to be eternal. Right. But if they really think that one through, the, anybody who thinks it through for like 10 minutes is going to go right. That's going to turn into hell mm -hmm, before yeah. very long because an eternity of basically just uh, sucking up to God and Jesus have fun. Have fun. You're going to yeah. be wanting to escape and get to hell before long. That's all I can tell you. An eternity of adoration of a couple beings. Yeah, that just doesn't sound like fucking fun to me. And it does on not the other sound hand, like fun. On the other hand, though, hell sounds like where all the cool people are going. Of course. Everybody <laughs> cool is going to be in hell. Because nobody cool in this world ever accepts absolute truth that's handed to them. They never have, they never will. Everybody cool is like, well, all right, let me think about this. And they look it over and they, t and they turn it over in their heads and they, and then they end up going, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but you don't just don't accept absolute truth because if you it, do, you're a fool and you get what you deserve. It always pissed me off that in the Bible, the one that is slightly skeptical, you know, doubting Thomas is mm -hmm. the one that's looked down upon. Well, he's kind of gross. I will say that. It's kind of a repulsive request to make. So on that level, you're like, oh, God, what a creepy dude. Get that fucker out of here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Somebody take that guy outside and knife him. I mean, that's a really a gross thing to ask, you know? So on that level, he's distasteful as a human being. But no, you're right. I mean, to the to the extent that what he's expressing is doubt. Yeah, no, doubt's bad. They're all wrong. You know, they they've turned the they're they're fools on a really profound level because it's a great thing in human in the human mind that we doubt. It's a beautiful thing. It's it's it leads us forward. It makes us ask good questions. It makes us probe at things and poke at things and turn things over and look at them carefully. I mean, it's a great gift. And when you turn that into something bad and sinful and even satanic and something that really should be squashed, and when you feel it, it it's weakness, it's moral weakness, and it may be actually coming. You know, you you're creating an opening for Satan to 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 get you wow you've really distorted human life you've distorted your own inner life and you're and you really are, are doing a huge disservice to children in particular by teaching them that kind of thing it's awful 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 definitely <laughs> yeah to, to squelch the one thing that makes us i don't know to, I, I i think that that i think curiosity is the one thing that really makes us different from a lot of other creatures that you know we're able to we're curious. We learn, and yeah. if you take that away from us, I mean, it, well, it it, yeah. it it pushes us forward, and and furthermore, there's a really good reason why Christians have the most horrendous senses of humor of any people on the planet, with the possible exception of Muslims, who I don't really know very well, but I presume theirs is even worse. But you, you know, it's like you you're removing pretty much the possibility of surprise. You know, you you know um, what's going to happen. You know uh, the story, and you know how it's going to end. And so, in a pretty big way, you can't really be surprised. So, goodbye to uh... a. <laughs> oh, my dog's barking. Is that 
you want to like stop for a minute? Oh man, where were we? Um, well, it started you, you Wesley. I think you were just yeah. asking me about it's like, did I grow up in a religious household? And right. Sort of launched from there. I think. It sounded spiritual, but not religious in a well, way. I wouldn't even say it was spiritual. I would say it was bogus spiritual, you know, not really. Well, I don't know what true spiritual is, but certainly my experience of it was not really spiritual. It was more, it was well, new it sound, kind of like the trendy new agey. Uh, astrology crystals it was it was yeah. yeah so i don't know if that's spiritual then it was highly spiritual <laughs> yes <laughs> so you did say it was la in the 70s yeah. yeah it was la in the 70s and as far as i know there's still a ton of that stuff going on i, mean, no. I haven't looked in la in a long time but i think there's still a lot and then you moved to portland where there's still a lot of that there's oh, tons man. yeah there's tons it's it's slightly different but yeah there's there's a, a lot of uh, kind of new age spirituality of a, a lot of sort. Uh, anti-science down in portland there is yeah you mean like that that uh, anti-fluoride anti-vaccination that kind mm-hmm. of and stuff. anti-gmo yeah yeah, there, there, there are a lot of people who just have this idea of living, you know, a very pure, healthy life, and they think that the man wants to introduce dangerous chemicals into their system that's going to harm their children in particular, and they get their backs up. And you know, I think they're idiots, really. Yeah, it's this this weird hybrid of of pro health, anti science, and conspiratorial thinking. Yeah. Right. It's not pretty. Those don't go well together. No, they don't. <laughs> no, it's a, you get a kind of a toxic little brew, actually. <laughs> and a lot of self-righteousness. I mean, there's a tremendous oh, God, amount yes. of just kind of, I would say, ignorance and self-certainty sitting right next to each other, which is mm-hmm. not good. As they sip their paps brews through their really thick beards. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And, you know, ride, ride their unicycles and, <laughs> you know, do their African throat singing and, you know, oh, no. all, just everything, all just Portland. Reality. Oh, man, you should come to Seattle. It's so, it's it's nice up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Seattle. Seattle's great. You get some of it, but it's not quite as weird. Oh, no. Yeah, no. It's not as, yeah, well, it's not so Portland-y. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, God, that uh, Portlandia. I I watched that a few times, and and it, I laughed for a while, but then I just started shaking my head. I just couldn't take it. Like, <laughs> yeah, that shit's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely getting at some real stuff. I think if you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations, or to support us on a per episode, monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. So, I heard that you also, uh, well, kind of uh, write uh, movie scripts and direct stuff like the amazing Evil Alien Conquerors. Oh, have you seen Evil Alien Conquerors? Actually... Yeah, Dietrich Bader, <laughs> badass. Because what? Say that again. Uh, Dietrich Bader. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like him? But yeah, no, yeah, Dietrich, um, Dietrich's funny. Well, you know, honestly, there's not you know a huge number of people who've seen Evil Aliens. Some <laughs> anybody who has, I'm like, really? Wow, you've actually seen it, you know? Because it, it's, it's a pretty low pro, low profile movie. All I can okay. say about Evil Aliens is my. God, we had fun making it. Holy <laughs> shit, we had fun making it. I mean, really, we did. For We didn't have a lot of time to shoot. We literally shot it in like two weeks. Oh, so shit. it was really, really long days and rushed. And But God damn, we were, you know, me and Diedrich and Chris Parnell and Mike Weston and uh, Tyler Labine, who played Croker, the guy who thinks he's a giant. <laughs> oh, man, we just howled with laughter the whole time. It was great. Super fun. You know, my, uh, people think it's kind of stupid and crude and not funny and whatever. You know, what am I going to say? I mean, that's what people think. But it sure was fun to make. And I love, I loved doing it. I mean, there's movies that uh, are just shit and they take themselves too seriously. But, yeah, I, I can definitely tell when somebody's having fun. Uh, and that that makes a big difference. 
Yeah, I think it helps. You know, sometimes you're watching a comedy and you just can kind of feel the people laughing off screen. You know, you can almost just feel that they're having to hold it together. A lot of the um, Will Ferrell, Adam McKay movies, in my opinion, are like that. You know, they're they're funny. Those guys are funny. They're good at it. And um, and and it does make a difference. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'll I'll be honest. Uh, Will Ferrell, I've only had one movie of his that I really liked. Yeah. What's that? Uh, what was it stranger than fiction? Oh, you don't, was it? you don't like Anchorman? I, I honestly don't. You don't like Talladega mm. nights? Not so much. Wow. All right. Well, you know, it's taste, man. It's taste. Yeah. Uh, kind of like Adam Sandler. can't stand him anymore. Um, you know, I think there's a big difference personally. Adam Sandler is a, can be a brilliant actor yeah. When other people use him, yeah, he's brilliant in uh, Punch Drunk Love, and he's really pretty brilliant in Funny People. He's a really interesting actor, but he's lazy comedically. He's really <laughs> mm-hmm. lazy, and he goes for pretty cheap, obvious jokes. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. And I think the difference with Farrell, I mean, you know, Adam McKay is Farrell's partner, and Adam McKay was like the head writer on SNL for a long time. And Adam McKay is, you know, they, he's ambitious. I mean, they're they're pushing themselves. So whether you like it or not. The degree of ambition, I would say, is much higher mm. in a Farrell McKay movie than it is well, and in, I, in an Adam Sandler movie. I just really like that uh, Will Ferrell played the straight man, and I think that he did that so well in Stranger mm-hmm. Than Fiction. He's a pretty good actor, and like all truly gifted comedians, they can do the straight man. And, and Jim Carrey, his, his, I don't really, I mean, Jim Carrey makes a, a decent funny movie, but man, when he was... When he's doing you know, the straight man, uh, he was pretty good in Eternal good. Sunshine. Yeah, you know? that was an amazing. Mm-hmm. Movie. Yeah, I mean he's 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 pretty good in that. And, I, and I've never been a Jim Carrey fan because that kind of manic, rubber faced, like laugh at me, laugh at me, laugh at me. It's too aggressive for me. It's like reminds me of like I don't know Jerry Lewis on Speed or something. Yeah, angry yeah. Jerry Lewis on Speed, um, <laughs> which is probably redundant when down to it, but it's not not for me. But Sometimes you know Jim Carrey. Uh, there was this movie, uh, the little movie that just came and went a couple of years ago called the Burt Wonderstone or something about a magician, and Jim Carrey plays this sort of extreme magician in it who does these self harming tricks, and he's really fucking funny in this movie. He was great. It was kind of a revelation for me because I've never really been a fan at all. Yeah, I just saw Fun with Dick and Jane, which was funny despite jim carrey being in it <laughs> he can be pretty manic you know and yeah. I mean, that was his thing very very manic style of making comedy you know and and some people love that 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 gets very popular at times uh, i would say kevin hart is kind of doing that now certainly you know um, that was the robin williams thing for many years mm-hmm. it's that style of comedy making where it's just ah, it's all really amped up you know but i would say jim carrey uh, Will Ferrell and Adam Sandler were all victims of getting typecast by directors who knew they could make a lot of money off of mm. basically the same movie, mm, I, or at least not, the same character. I don't, I, not necessarily. You know, you get to that level of power and success, and you're picking your own movies. Really, I mean, those guys are not—they are not puppets at all. Those guys are um, when you're you know, making studios hundreds of millions of dollars as all those guys have done, you're picking your own projects. So, um, no, that's on them. Actually, if you, okay. whatever you like or don't <laughs> like in what they've done, um, that's got a lot. That's okay. Still. So early two thousands, uh, Adam Sandler got lazy. Yeah, I would, I would agree that until he that's stopped lazy. making money and actually had to start trying again. <laughs> well, has that happened yet? Is the question. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Will Ferrell. I don't know I, that that's happened. I would say, you know, like, granted, I haven't watched a whole lot of his movies because I saw two or three that he was basically the same character with a different script, and I got bored with that. Well, then I saw Anchorman, and that was interesting. Mm-hmm. It was entertaining. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he kind of does that thing. He he plays blustery, clueless, uh, kind of uptight American man as Mm -hmm. well as anybody ever has in my view he's really good at that 
and his oh. George W. Bush, if you haven't seen his oh, special, yeah. which is called Thank You, <laughs> You're Welcome, America, where he does George <laughs> W. It's it's pretty great. All right. I I definitely, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on a, a couple other things here. Yes, sir. Uh, you're probably way more famous for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And, <laughs> than uh, Evil Alien Conquerors, yes. Yeah, probably agree. so. <laughs> I would agree. And and Bogus Journey was still pretty fucking cool, too. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, dude, seriously. <laughs> I mean, like, fucking Keanu and Alex and George Carlin. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, they were great. How did that happen? <laughs> well, gosh, you know, I mean, the short version is that Ed Solomon, who I co-wrote it with, we... He and I were college friends, and we started hanging around and just laughing together, as, you know, sometimes happens. You just meet somebody, and you make each other laugh. And we did, and uh, we uh, we decided at a certain point with a couple other friends to do like an improv group, get together and just improvise. <laughs> Not for an audience, because we never did it in front of an audience. We just sort of wanted to play with comedic ideas and just goof around, really. And one night, uh, the suggestion was two teenage boys talking about world events. And it was me and Ed. And I just said, how's it going, Bill? And he said, how's it going, Ted? And we just started talking. And we just started doing Bill and Ted. And they just kind of clicked for us really quickly. And we went out afterwards, had coffee, and kind of talked as Bill and Ted for quite a while, you know, getting, <laughs> building their backstories, Missy and Captain Logan and Deacon and, you know, just all of it. And, and plus a bunch of stuff that later fell away. And then we just kind of did them for like a year, you know, we'd just call each other on the phone and just be Bill and Ted, or we'd write letters <laughs> to each other as Bill and Ted. Cause we just got a kick out of them. They were funny. They were really fun characters to be. And then at a certain point we thought, well, we should do something with these guys. Um, and neither one of us really wanted to be a performer. So we thought, well, let's, let's write them, you know, let's, let's write them. And then we came up with the time travel idea and put them in a movie. So what was it like? Uh, how was Keanu like pre point break pre matrix? Like, uh, he, he was cool, man. I mean, seriously, um, he was a cool dude and he is a cool dude. I've never met anybody like Keanu. Well, not really. The only other person I've met who's even vaguely like Keanu is, um, Shane Black, who's now, you know, directed the, you know, to the last Boy Scout now directed the most recent Iron Man movie. Cause I went to college with him too. And different guys, but similarly unusual guys, like the kind of guys you, you interact with and you're like, wow, there's just nobody like them. You know, Keanu was like really interesting. He was strange. He was sort of like a being from another planet, but he was like a super cool being from another planet. Um, he was, he was interesting. I, I mean, I, I liked him. He was, a, he was a cool dude. Yeah. He, he, he used to walk around the set, like in a, wearing a skirt and combat boots. So there's a little idea of just Keanu. Oh, an actual circa skirt 19, like a utility kilt. Yeah. Kind of circa 1980 seven you know so a long time ago hmm. wow okay. yeah but he was he was, uh, he was he's an interesting guy so how was it and okay I, I heard the uh your, your interview on scathing atheists yeah um the script that ended up actually going into the movie wasn't quite what you had originally written right for the first bill and ted or was it the first or the second uh well, you know, they both changed. I mean, the first one's pretty close, actually. Um, the second one w was originally called Bill and Ted Go to Hell. And um, it's we spent more time in hell because we loved the idea of Bill and Ted in hell and just sort of enjoying being in hell and getting really, like, impossible to torment because they thought it was fun. <laughs> um, and uh, originally in the, in the first draft they actually brought biblical figures back with them to San Dimas to help them in act three. They brought like, uh, you know, whatever Moses and Noah and, you know, not Jesus, but like Abraham, I don't know. And, uh, that ended up changing. It just didn't work for whatever reason. But, um, and there, yeah, the second one changed, I would say, um, more the first ones. I mean, tonally, the first one's different because when Ed and I were writing it, because we were sort of obsessed with um, Python, as 
most people who were interested in comedy in the 1970s were. It was Python, man. It was Python. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody loved Python. How do you not love Python? And we loved, we both loved Python, and we wanted Bill and Ted to feel kind of like a Python movie or even the Python show that had this sort of wild, loose, loopy uh, rhythm to it. And the movie, you know, ends up much more kind of straightforward than that. Uh, which is fine. I mean, the movie's fine, but it's it was it had a different tone, same script, pretty much. And this is 1987 that it shot, so this is a long time ago. This is nowadays most comedies. There's a tremendous amount of improvising that goes on, a tremendous amount of improvising. Just like, okay, just make shit up now. And from a writer's standpoint, you know, not you don't love that. And, and that wasn't so much the case in '87. I mean, they, they pretty much did the script why okay. has it moved to more oh. improvising well a couple of people did it and had a lot of success with it and and if you're very very good at it it can work like judd apatow mm -hmm. does it a lot and you know judd apatow is funny and he and he attracts funny people and you can get something that's completely fresh that's being made up on the spot and therefore is funny and alive and unrehearsed in a way that's that you can feel kind of on on uh, uh, when you watch it later. Um, and uh, M uh, McKay does a decent amount of improvisation too. So it worked enough times, it became the new big idea. Like, well, that's how you make comedy. But now you have a lot of people doing it that way who don't really know how to do it and aren't really that funny. I mean, it requires a tremendously funny hand in charge who can kind of steer it and guide it and be like, right, right, right. That, no, not that. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Go there, go there. Because if you don't have that, then it's almost inevitably going to end up going towards really obvious, you know, the obvious moves, farts and dicks and mm -hmm. asses and, you know, just cheap raunch. And so there's a lot of cheap raunch these days. Between like a, like you're saying, between Judd, uh, Seth Rogen, and James Franco, they made you know a, a really good trifecta right there. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're able to actually banter off each other very well. It can work, you know. It can work. And Apatow is a really smart guy, and he attracts smart people, and so he's he's pulled it off on a few occasions. And uh, Seth Rogen is is quite a funny guy as well, and probably is pretty good at improvising, but you know, it takes, it's, it's really a director thing. You got to have a director there who kind of knows how to manage that. So I'm curious, uh, how, how much, uh, bantering and, uh, and such was on Rapture Palooza. Oh Jesus. Like 90%. Really? I mean, from my standpoint, I, I mean, I honestly, I think the movie's horrible, you know, I mean, like, I sorry, I laughed a lot. Oh, well, I'm glad <laughs> you did. You know, I'm glad you did. I, I would like to think you would have laughed even more at the version of what I wrote. It uh -huh. ends up being a lot of like dick jokes and a yeah. lot of fag jokes and a lot, you know, it's just like, you just put the guys together and like, well, fuck you fag. No, you're the fag, you know, like I, 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 I you know, I, I was, um, uh, I was I was not pleased, right. <laughs> actually, I mean, and Craig, I don't Craig think the Robinson. director knew how to manage all yeah. that improvisation. Really, I like Craig Robinson, but yeah, the Beast, his character was a little well, Satan essentially. Yeah, right? you know, my version yeah, was but, he was a lot, lot, lot more insecure and kind of human, and and you know, once you get Craig Robinson, who's like six five, two forty, big hulking guy, very confident that you know the joke kind of went away for the yeah. most part. But, so uh, whatever. That's what I think that uh, Rob Cordray uh, picked up a lot of those insecurities, and uh, Anna Kendrick was still pretty awesome. Anna Kendrick kind of did follow the script. Uh, Anna mm -hmm. Kendrick and John Francis Daly, who played you know the the her her boyfriend, they they kind of actually did stick to the script. But uh, Craig and his gang, man, they did all right. You know, whatever. Okay, guys. You know, I spent a long time writing this script, but you know, whatever. You want right. to just make stuff up, okay? And just just so people know, uh, the, the the short and dirty of this is uh, two teens battle the way through a, a religious apocalypse on a mission to defeat the Antichrist. Right. And uh, God, uh, Anna Gaster, please tell me you wrote that whole thing about her getting kicked out of heaven. 
No, I did write that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. What I yeah I did write that, and that was actually a, more of a thing. And in, in what I wrote, what I didn't write is like I think they added some joke where like her husband is like gives her shit for like what did you do? Did you you know like in my, my what I thought was funny is she had no idea she was in heaven. She'd been raptured, and then suddenly bloop, you know, she's back. She's sent out, and she doesn't know why. Um, I thought that was funny, but. You know, they, to me, they sort of um, gilded the lily, so to speak, on that one. But no, I did write that. Nice. Well, thank yeah. God. You know, you picked out something I actually wrote. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, her getting kicked out. I mean, she, she's, she's just not a nice person. And it's, so, yeah, it, it's just, just desserts, and it's really fucking funny. <laughs> Good. Glad you liked it. Oh man. <laughs> so, is there a Bill and Ted three coming? Yeah, well, we're working on it. Yeah, no shit. Oh. Wait, what? Yeah, I have not listened to Noah, so this is new to me. Yeah, I just saw this as a in related news off of Bill and Ted two oh. or no, Chris Matheson IMDb. Yeah, oh, we've shit. been uh, we've been working on this for a few years now, trying to get uh trying to get everything lined up, and yeah, I'm I trying think to we're, get we're getting we're getting reasonably close at this point. Trying to get Alex and Keanu back. Oh no, they're. Maybe? I mean, we wouldn't have done it without them. No, oh, they're. Gosh. Yeah, no, they're in. We've been working with them for several years on the script. Oh, no, nice. it's basically just trying to get the money money lined up at this point. Yes. Yeah. Three. Yeah, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be really. It's gonna be. I mean, it was like when we started. Uh, Ed and I hadn't written Bill and Ted in twenty years, and we just sort of looked at each other like, "All right, well, here we go. Let's see." And you know, it was like riding a bike. I mean, we just, we know those guys. We have, we just, it was fun. It was really fun writing them again. It was great, actually. Start tossing a few letters and into the, ooh, actually writing letters again <laughs> and going back and forth some Bill and Ted. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so hopefully before long there'll be some meaningful news about this. Any teaslers or spoilers you can give us? Well, you know, uh, the basic premise of it is they they that this song that they were supposed to come up with that was going to save everything they have not come up with <laughs> and they're and suddenly the heat gets turned up on them like where is the fucking song you need to come up with the song now and so they have to go off in search of the song nice <laughs> awesome yeah. yeah oh my goodness yes Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh man, yes. Sorry, just too long. Your yeah, childhood dreams for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully it, it'll be really. Uh, I mean, not only satisfying to see the guys again, but like, wow, we've really worked hard on trying to come up with a great story and and like a really funny story too. I can a eh? yeah. I didn't know how much of your work I actually knew and until. You know, I started looking up. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, you've been kind of part of my life for quite a while. So, dude, seriously, thank you. That's my pleasure. (laughs) I don't know what to say. (laughs) Well, you know, say that you'll, you know, make that fucking Bill and Ted 3. We are working on making that fucking Bill and Ted 3, man. Fucking A. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. All right, Chris, uh, what stuff do you have to pimp? Uh, it's the book, man. All right. Uh, you got a, a, a Twitter's or a Facebook I do not. I don't, I don't do any of that. No? Okay. Fair enough. No, no. It's just the book's available on Amazon. That's, that's, I mean, it's also in some bookstores, but I don't know specifically which ones, but it's, it's easy bookstore. to get at Amazon. Yeah, I see it on Amazon. So yeah, I'll, I'll have links to, I guess, your IMDB page and the book on Amazon. Sure. In the show sounds, notes. Sounds good. Awesome. Number one new release in religious humor. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, four and a half stars on Amazon. That's good. Not bad, not bad. Too bad it's out of 20 stars, but yeah. Yeah, bad, well, bad. you know, if it was out of five, it would be good. Out of 20, not so good, but still. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, okay. thank you very much for joining us. It was my pleasure, gentlemen. And if when, you ever come out to Seattle, I'll buy you beers, man. Ah, sounds great. Well, it was fun talking to you. Yeah. Fucking A. It's a real pleasure, and for our listeners, we'll be back next week with news.
Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.